This lecture is going to briefly review some of the uh, neurobiology of the body stress response. We will review the uh, ways in which the nervous system and the endocrine system work together to uh, manifest a uh, response in the body um, to respond to stressful situations. First, we need to review kind of a basic understanding of the divisions of the nervous system. Uh, this is likely a, a very simple review of stuff covered in uh, intro psychology or other psychology courses. Uh, first of all, we know that uh, uh, one major part of the nervous system is the central nervous system, or the CNS. This includes the brain and the spinal cord. We also uh, have the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. The peripheral nervous system is subdivided into two different systems. Uh, the somatic nervous system, this is the nervous system that controls sensory and motor functions. So it in includes input from our five senses as well as motor control of skeletal muscles. And then there's the autonomic nervous system. Uh, this nervous system is involved in homeostatic regulation of the body. So keeping the body at a homeostatic or steady state uh, baseline state. The autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into two systems, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the system that regulates the quiet or calming processes, the return to homeostasis in the body. This is the system that's always trying to get us back to a steady state, baseline, calm level. Then there's the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is the system most involved in marshalling a response to a stressor because this system is designed to mobilize and expend energy and to prepare the body uh, to respond to challenges. If you check out this figure that uh, shows the uh, sort of branches of the sympathetic nervous system on the left and the parasympathetic nervous system on the right, you see that there's some important differences. The main one I'd want to point out is notice on the sympathetic nervous system on the left that most of the connections branch off of the spinal cord. The spinal cord is where we have reflexive responses in the body, responses that don't require higher brain functioning. And so the sympathetic nervous system has connections to many of the same places as the parasympathetic nervous system, but it's designed to be a quick emergency response system that doesn't necessarily involve higher order brain functioning. With the parasympathetic nervous system on the right, you notice that most of its connections out to the body originate from the brain, from the lower brain and brain stem regions, where the response may be a little bit slower. A few of those you'll notice do come from the spinal cord near the uh, sacral part of the spine, but for the most part these um, uh, connections all uh, come from the brain. And that's an important thing to keep in mind, that the uh, sympathetic nervous system is designed for quick, immediate emergency responses, so uh, it has connections from the reflexive parts of the central nervous system in the spinal cord. The parasympathetic nervous system is a slower, more steady state response and, and originates in the brain. The body's response to stress is regulated by both nervous system and endocrine systems working together. Uh, to me, it's one of the more fascinating things of the body is the way the body coordinates two different systems to uh, prepare the body to respond to stress. And in part, these systems are generally organized to respond to two different uh, types of stressors. The immediate, acute, what we sometimes call fight or flight response, which we'll talk about in a slide or two, and that's where we're designing the body to prepare to survive a existential threat. So if you are out in the world and you encounter a predator, um, you want an emergency, mobilizing, um, activating response that will prepare the body to fight or flee to survive. And that's what the nervous system primarily does, uh, particularly the peripheral nervous system, um, and more specifically the sympathetic nervous system responds to that immediate in a matter of milliseconds kind of response. The endocrine system is really more responsible for the long-lasting sustained response to ongoing or chronic stressors because that system is better designed to, to mobilize resources in the body on a longer-term basis. The nervous system is prepared to do that in a split second, but it doesn't last very long. One of the ways we can think about the way um, our uh, response to stress is mediated 
what happens in the environment is, and what happens in our body is mediated by what happens in some systems inside of us. Uh, of course, it starts with our higher brain centers, our perceptions, um, our ability to see, understand, interpret what's happening around us. When the higher brain, center, higher brain centers uh, identify a stressor, they signal the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is kind of the clearinghouse for these kind of messages. The hypothalamus then has connections to make two important systems go. Uh, first is the brainstem controls and autonomic messages that go to the vital organs and local reflexes for that immediate response. And then the endocrine controls that, and the endocrine messengers, those chemical messengers, when we say endocrine we're talking about uh, hormones and other kinds of chemical messengers that circulate primarily through the bloodstream to deliver messages throughout the body. Um, those endocrine messages then can um, communicate with vital organs and local reflexes to, to promote a longer term response to stress. The immediate stress response is what we often call a fight or flight response. It involves primarily the nervous system but also the adrenal glands. Um, both the nervous system and the adrenal glands do the same function to, to create a fight or flight response and that is that they flood both the bloodstream immediately and directly onto tissue surfaces uh, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline. Um, epinephrine um, and another uh, um, substance that's less important in this response, norepinephrine, but is there as well, what these do is they prepare the body for physical responses to an existential threat. Uh, the there are some uh, neurons in the nervous system that actually have endings directly on things like cardiac tissue that can directly release adrenaline right onto the surface of that tissue immediately. The um, endocrine system or adrenal glands will put adrenaline in the bloodstream, which will get there uh, quickly, probably in a matter of a few seconds, but your body also needs that immediate matter of split second uh, timing uh, activation of these systems as well. The fight or flight response you may have heard of before, you may uh, know it well. There's a number of different changes going in the body that come along with a fight or flight response. If you've ever been startled, alarmed, you've ever um, been in a tra uh, traumatic experience where perhaps your uh, life was threatened or um, uh, uh, you saw life being threatened, you notice these immediate changes in your body that are really, they're uncontrollable. Um, a number of things happen, including pupil dilation, your pupils get bigger, uh, increased perspiration, increased heart rate. All of these changes are designed to, to uh, assist the body in surviving an existential threat uh, from perhaps a predator or other threat in the environment. Uh, so for example, pupil dilation is designed to let in more light and improve vision. Uh, some also think it may be to make uh, oneself more intimidating, perhaps to a predator. Increased perspiration is to cool the body in preparation for a tremendous metabolic output with perhaps fighting or fleeing. Increased heart rate to deliver more oxygen to skeletal muscles. Increased respiratory rate to improve the rate of uh, exchange of oxygen in the bloodstream and removing carbon dioxide from the bloodstream for skeletal muscles that will be working very hard. Increased blood flow to the large muscles and decreased blood flow to the, to the viscera or periphery. If you've ever had that experience of having cold hands or cold feet under an acute stressor, that's because the blood flow to your fingertips and to your toes is being restricted and the body is prioritizing blood flow to your large muscles. When blood flow is also restricted from your, um, uh, from your gastrointestinal area, sometimes we experience that as gastric distress as well. We may have piloerection, which is another way of saying hair stands on end. You've had that feeling of the hair standing up on the back of your neck. Perhaps you've uh, ever had a pet cat and you've noticed when they're backed into a corner or really upset about something, their fur stands on end. It makes them look larger, perhaps more intimidating. Um, and lastly, um, this urge to urinate. Uh, many people when they're under stress feel the need to uh, urinate immediately. Uh, a couple hypotheses about why that assists with survival. Uh, one is it offloads weight, so if you uh, clear the bladder that offloads unnecessary weight, you may be able to flee more successfully. Um, also, if you urinate, you may be a less tasty morsel for that predator. Uh, think about animals. You may catch uh, lizards or turtles or whatnot, frogs, that uh, often urinate when they're captured, and partly that's to make you a less desirable meal. Now, one of the things I like to think about with a fight-or-flight response is that while these responses are sort of part of our evolutionary history 
and they are a helpful way to respond to acute stressors um, throughout our history as a species, um, they're not necessarily the most helpful responses in today's stressors. If you, uh, for example, are going to take a really high stakes uh, final exam, you have to pass it or you can't graduate. Or maybe you're going to ask a romantic interest on a date. Or maybe you're going for a really important job interview you really want. These will be the kind of responses your body's going to respond, but they're not all that helpful. So a lot of our coping we have to do with acute stress in today's world is trying to counteract the uh, natural responses to acute stressors that just aren't that helpful in the context of today's stressors. Uh, when we talk about stress interventions in a few lectures, um, that's mostly what that's about, is how do we cope with this um, uh, sort of inappropriate, unwelcome, inconvenient response in order to perform adequately in the face of stressors in today's world. The longer term response to stress is um, modulated by the uh, HPA or hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis it's called. What the HPA axis does is stimulates the release of corticosteroids in the body which are kind of a natural medicine that combat inflammation, promote healing, mobilize energy. So if one is going to be involved in a fighting or fleeing situation, it may be necessary to control inflammation and promote healing to mobilize the immune system and also to mobilize energy to the, to the body so that fatigue doesn't threaten the survival of the, uh, the organism. Uh, cortisol secretion is very sensitive to stress and it tends to be fairly predictable. So a lot of scientists use it as a measure of stress, um, including several uh, scientists in the Department of Psychology. So one thing we might wonder is why, do, why are there so many individual differences in the stress response? Why do some people seem to uh, sweat through their clothes and, and just really struggle under acute stressors, whereas other people seem very calm and collected? Well, there's a couple different reasons. One is nobody really experiences stress in quite the exact same context. There are differences in social status, the resources people have, their uh, history of experience with this stressor or similar stressors that can modulate the stress response. We also know that humans engage in lots of what we call appraisal processes. Appraisals are cognitive processing of the environment. They're the way that we make sense, the way we think about and think through uh, our experience of the world. Lazarus and Folkman, two psychologists we mentioned in the previous lecture, propose that there's two really key processes that are important in the appraisal process for humans, primary and secondary appraisal. Primary appraisal seeks to answer a fairly simple question. Is this situation relevant? Is it good or bad? Is it a threat? Is this something that demands an immediate response? The secondary appraisal really comes after, and that asks the question of, what can be done? Am I capable? Do I have the resources? Is this a stressor I can manage, or is this stressor overwhelming and unmanageable? The amount of stress individuals experience is really a function of these two appraisal processes working in conjunction. So it's not necessarily what happens in the environment or in the context itself that, that perfectly predicts stress. The individual has a lot to do with whether situations are experienced as stress and to what intensity uh, that stress might be experienced. This figure demonstrates how that might play out. If we start with an environmental event in the upper left-hand part of this figure here, Environmental events only exist to the extent that they are perceived and interpreted by individuals, and that's where Lazarus and Folkman say we go through this appraisal process. The first appraisal we make is what we call a primary appraisal on this figure called primary beliefs and commitments. What's our first thought about this? Is it a threat or a challenge, or is it benign or irrelevant? If it's benign or irrelevant, we simply ignore it and move on and, and attend to different things in the environment. If the situation is a threat or a challenge, we then do the secondary appraisal, and we look at what's on this figure called secondary resources, options, effectiveness. We ask, is this something that's manageable? Do I have the resources? Do I have the know-how? Do I have the time? And that then is going to determine what kinds of coping behaviors we're likely to engage in. Those coping behaviors then determine both our psychological responses and our behavior responses. What do we do? Do we flee the stressor? Do we avoid it? Or do we engage in trying to tackle the stressor? Do we take it head on? Do we try to problem solve? Psychological responses largely determine what our biological response is. If the psychological response is that this is a uh, serious, important, and relevant stressor, uh, then we're likely to have a stronger biological response. Our biological response, in turn, feeds back into our primary appraisals. 
Have you ever known somebody who sort of works themselves into an anxiety attack as they think about a stressor? Their first thought about that stressor may have not been that dramatic, but as they think about it in this process kind of cycles, the more they worry about it, the stronger their, their stress response. The more their stress response, uh, the more extreme their, their primary and secondary appraisals become. And they really work themselves um, into an anxiety attack or a panic over this situation that maybe initially wasn't so bad. That's an example of how this feedback loop can play out. So this is a general model that helps us understand the various processes and factors that come into play when individuals experience stress and how the individual is really in between the environment and the stress response itself.